Until 10 or 15 minutes after I started talking. <laughs> Why not get it all going from the beginning, right? So be it. I'd like to start by reading this verse from the Bible from St. Paul. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weakness. Paul is talking about himself. He is the man that had these incredible spiritual experiences 14 years ago, but he is not wanting to talk about them for some reason. But then he goes on to say, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain. So no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. Of course, I have to explain why I'm reading this quotation and what it means. But in, before we do that, I want to refer back to speeches that, a speech that Father gave. This was, you know, I, I have often explained that one of the greatest speeches I believe Father ever gave, one of the most valuable and precious insights into his providence was given on May 1st, 1954, not 1954, 2004, on the anniversary of the founding, the 50 year anniversary of the founding of HSA. That's the speech that Father talks about God as a being who has no form. He talks about the importance of the spiritual world and he talks about the conscience and the consciousness of human beings. And he explains in great detail his providence and his mission. But the night before, he gave that speech, I found out that he had spoken at a dinner. And this is the content of the speech he gave, which is also referencing the fact that this is the 50 year anniversary. 50 years ago on this significant day, on May 1st, 1954, as I was walking this path of upholding God's will, I founded the official organization of the Movement for Unification. The path I have pioneered for half a century is one no one has really understood. God alone has been dri the dri my driving force as I have walked this lonely path of persecution and suffering, which is stained with my blood, sweat, and tears. The Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity was not created as another denomination or sect. I was fully aware that that would not have been God's desire. Fifty years ago, 
the movement for unification began as the Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity. In other words, it began as an association for the sake of unification. Selecting this name, which portends the unification of global Christianity, and further, the unification of religions and of the spirit world, was in itself a risky step to take. The development of the Christian tradition and the formation of its cultural sphere were achieved through the faith, sacrifice, passion, and searching of exemplary Christian saints, leaders, and scholars. Despite this, Christianity has splintered into numerous denominations which are in conflict with one another even today. Under these circumstances, unifying Christianity is no easy task. The unification of religions and further the unification of the spirit world are even greater tasks. The concept of unification that I set forth does not just involve superficial unification or unification merely in form. It involves fundamental and complete harmony and unification according to God's ideal. First, this is achieved through spiritual works. The unification of religions and within the spiritual world cannot be achieved by force or authority or by any other external condition. When the foundation that allows God to work on earth is laid and the conditions sought by the saints are met, spiritual works can occur. The power to spur good spirits into action lies with God and the spirit world. God and the spirit world can only do it. Not force, not authority, not making conditions. Second, unification is achieved through truth and love. I have revealed that the relationship between God and man is that of a parent and child bound by true love. I have also revealed to the whole world the fundamental principles of life and of this universe, the true nature of original sin, of restoration, and of the spiritual world, and the history of God's providence. I have not only done that, I have taught about true love and put it into practice. Religion is a training center, an educational institute to repair dysfunctional man and return him to his original state. Religious teachings are not for the sake of religion itself. Religion is the means to realize God's will, which is to educate and recreate us as his children. It is impossible for God to be contained within the limited doctrines and rituals made by religion. The mission of religion is to cultivate our character through a life of faith that embraces enlightenment and personal growth so that we can attend God in our everyday lives. So that we can attend God in our everyday lives. Everything goes back to one reality, and that is the reality of God. It's about having a relationship with God as our parent. I am a son of God, or a daughter of God. We are the children of God. That is the original purpose of creation. And everything that Father did and created and has done for his entire life was for the purpose of solving the historical problems and bringing us to a point where we could finally focus on the one core reality that is essential for each one of us, and that is to have a loving parental relationship with God. 
as our parent. Establishing that one core relationship is everything. Everything. The world has come to call us the Unification Church in place of our full name. Many years ago, I said that I was looking forward to the day when we could bring an end to the Unification Church. That is because the mission of the Unification Church has been to restore and recreate the ideal of God on earth, the ideal kingdom of God, the original world envisaged by him at the time of creation, can only be realized when the mistakes of our ancestors who betrayed God are completely eradicated, and when the supra-religious, supranational realm of liberation and complete freedom is perfected such that the original realm of love, the four-position foundation ideal, is realized. This means transcending the mission of any one church or denomination and perfecting the family ideal of true love. Yet the focus of churches and religions until now has been on individual salvation. No religion until now has ever put emphasis on the salvation of the family. Because the original sin was never explained. Without the original sin being explained as being the influence of of Lucifer, the archangel that became Satan, who misused, caused Eve and Adam to misuse love, and it destroyed the relationship in the family, and prevented God from having a loving relationship with his sons and daughters, thereby when they married, and when they had children, and when the children were born out of that relationship, they were born out of a relationship that was separated from the love of God. You know, several, you know, I don't know how long ago it was, a couple of months ago, I attended the conference in Greensboro and I, I spoke very strongly and very highly about the uh, whole concept of challenging pornography in this country at this time, not just in this country, but in the world. And so I was, I've been reading this book, The Ten Lies Men Believe About Porn, and I pointed out that this is not just a book about pornography. This is a book about the idea of what is it that separates us from having a relationship with God? What is it that prevents us, that blocks us from having a relationship with God? Is it our actions? Is it the, the mistakes that we make? We commit a sin, and when we commit a sin, then God doesn't love us anymore. And we have to feel ashamed and guilty, and now, you know, we're separated from God because of sin. Sin separates us from God. But it's actually much deeper than that. And until now, until true parents have come, the way, the way back to God, in some ways, has always been blocked. Even the most sincere and dedicated and, you know, Powerful Christians, their way was blocked. Going back to what St. Paul said, I have a thorn. I have a problem. God, will you help me with this problem? Three times he begged God. And after three times, God said, No, it will remain. And then Paul went through a transformation having to deal with the thorn in his flesh. What is the thorn in his flesh? It's his sin. It's his concept. So I'm, I'm struggling with something. I have a problem. Will you help me with this problem? God doesn't help him with the problem. But then he discovers something even much deeper about his relationship with God. He discovers that God is going to love him whether he has a problem or not. As I was reading this book, I came into this chapter. I 
This is body number seven. That Jesus can set others free from sin or from pornography, but he can't help me. The reason why this author has this experience is because he makes a confession in the book. He says, I want to tell you something. This is in the middle of the book. So I have to tell you, even though I'm writing this book about the problems of pornography, every, every year, two or three times, I still fall back. I haven't, I haven't completely stopped having given take with this desire. It's still a thorn in my side. He says, but when I fall back, when I fail, when I find myself making a mistake again, you know, committing this sin, what do I do? Do I hide myself away, pretend it didn't happen? Do I become depressed? Do I become hopeless? Do I become like, oh, you know, there I am again. I, I can't really overcome after all. Do I, do I blame others? Do I, do I uh, you know, accuse others? Do I become so overcome by my guilt or by my shame that I push God away? When you make a mistake, do you really think your relationship with God has changed? No. What is the sin? What is the sin that keeps you away from God? It's not your actions. It's what's going on inside your heart. God didn't take the thorn away from St. Paul. Because as Paul said, if God took this thorn away from me and suddenly I was able to overcome my problems like this, maybe I would become conceited. Maybe I would become proud. Maybe I would become arrogant. I would begin to walk around thinking, look at me, how good I am. I'm able to overcome. I'm able to, 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 to solve my problems. What's wrong with you? How come you can't solve your problem? Look at me, I can solve mine. Arrogance, pride. And yet in front of God, God knows fallen nature. Fallen nature. You do something, you make some good condition, you become victorious, you accomplish something. And what happens? You become proud of that. And that pride is a seed. A seed that lets fallen nature back in. Satan. Satan came in and would work through that seed and would later be able to accuse you again. I too, three weeks ago, I found myself in front of my computer clicking on porn sites for about a half hour. After standing up here and talking to everybody, I, I went to that uh, you know, thing and yeah. Of course, this has been going on with me all my life. So it's not a surprise to me. But I felt a little bit surprised, frustrated, angered. But then I started really praying. I said, God, what, what is really going on? What is really going on deep inside my heart and my soul? Why? Why did I choose in this moment to go in that direction? Instead of, you know, maintaining a certain standard of, of righteousness or goodness. And deep, deep down inside, I realized that in, those, in, in that day, in that time, in that period, I was doubting God. I was doubting true mother. I was doubting true parents. I was doubting this movement. I was doubting my relationship with God. Just ever so subtly, ever so slightly, but it was real and it was strong. And it was just enough to make me become frustrated and angry. And to feel like I wanted to say, F this. I'm tired of this. I don't care anymore. 
I don't care anymore. Like the song. <laughs> click, click, click. A little bit of joy and happiness from this direction. I really learned something. And th this author, he goes through the same thing. You know, this, this person that wrote this book, he lost his wife and his family because of his situation. Not because he didn't change his life, but because he put off too long being honest. But he has remained celibate. He hasn't remarried for several years now. Because deep inside his mind and his heart, he's keeping himself, hoping that his previous wife might someday come back to him. If she realizes or recognizes that he's serious about facing his issue and his problem. But he admitted, every year, a couple of times a year, I end up falling off the wagon. That's what it's called when you're, a, when you're a drunk or an alcoholic. It's called falling off the wagon. How many of us here haven't fallen off the wagon? How many of us here don't make mistakes anymore? I mean, except this is base, obviously. <laughs> And yeah, the two. Dynamic duo back there. Here's the point. The point is, true parents have done something incredible. What true parents did is, through the blessing, they solved the problem of original sin. You say, how can you say that? Look at you. You just, took, you just admitted you stood right here and said you're still sinning. Am I? Is that the definition of sin now? What is it that separates us from God? Because I make a mistake? Because I, I blow up and I yell at my wife? Or because the relationship isn't working and it gets broken and then there's a divorce? Because I have a spouse that, that, that took his own life and committed suicide? Now that's it? There's no more relationship with God. It's all over. Absolutely not. You can't break your relationship with God. Physically, in the material world, things can break. Things can be broken so they can't be repaired. But in the deepest sense, deep inside our mind, deep inside our heart, deep inside our soul, if we have a true understanding of what, who God is and what our relationship with God is meant to be, that can't be broken. It can't be broken. The reason it has been broken is because a liar has told us that we are sinners, that we are not deserving of God's love. Satan. But according to my understanding of God's providence, True parents defeated Satan. They cut our relationship with Satan, and we are under the lineage of God. We are under God's lineage, God's authority, God's dominion, God's control. And how does God control? What force does God control with? The Attorney General? The police? Words? Laws, rules, regulations, the old ways, the only force God is going to change this world with is the force of true love. True love. That is the force that will go inside the deepest part of a person's mind and soul and will be there to help them to change and to grow, and to become the original person that they're meant to become. When someone falls off the wagon or makes a mistake, okay, I'm sorry, pay the price, repent, acknowledge, admit, accept, and start over. Try harder. Make greater effort 
But if we really look closer and closer and closer, what caused us to fall off the wagon in the first place? And we can discover it's our re broken relationship with God. Our relationship with God is broken. That's why we're behaving that way. So my, my goal isn't to focus on the sin. Okay, now I'm going to, you know, it's not about pornography. It's not about alcoholism. It's not about anger and resentment. It's not about your marriage. It's, it's about your heart. How much do you know God loves you? How much are you realizing that we are eternal beings? We live eternally. We have a spiritual world that we're going to live in for eternity. Whatever's happening here and now is temporary. Our purpose in life is to go through these challenges and to grow our heart and to love. You know, the author that wrote this book, he talks about how if God had ever told him that he would someday become a writer of books and would, would, would be going out and, and witnessing to men and trying to help them with their problem, he would never have been able to handle it. He said, that's ridiculous. But step by step, little by little, God guided him through his mistakes. And he eventually became a person who, who has this mission to go out. We are the same. Blessed central families. God has blessed us. You think because you're divorced or because your family is broken and everybody's family is broken. My family is broken. My relationship with my wife isn't what it should be. It's my fault. It's her fault. It's our fault. It's Satan's fault. It's everyone's fault. It's nobody's fault. Doesn't matter whose fault it is. It is what it is. And it's our responsibility to deal with it. And gradually, gradually, as the days go on, and as life goes forward, we are growing out and discovering and learning about God. It's about God. Yesterday, Sharon and I went to the St. Augustine graduation. You know, St. Augustine, it's beautiful. The speaker, you know, the keynote speak, what do they call him? The guy that speaks at the graduations? Keynote. Keynote, keynote speaker, right? The, he, he, was, he was some uh, black preacher from Philadelphia from the Episcopal Church, you know? And he gets up there and he starts talking. <laughs> it was nothing but a sermon. From the beginning to the end, it was all about God and, and believe, you know, and Jesus and God and, and knowing, you know, the whole thing. It was just a huge, yeah, everybody is in this huge, this is the graduation with all the seniors there and everybody, and the guy's just talking about God <laughs> and, 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 and our relationship with God. God was and it just felt so correct. It felt so right on. And while I was standing, I realized, wow. This is why God blessed America with a black president. Even though, yeah, oh yeah, we know this president in many ways has gone off the deep end concerning spiritual things. But I thought to myself, this is the foundation. The, the black church and, the, and the, the, the spirit, the culture of this, this kind of, 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 of place, you know, St. Augustine's College. This is where the spirit of God feels he can still be there. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, after all of these years of the anti-God movement in America, I have never felt that God was even more present than he was. I've been to St. Augustine graduations every year now for many years in a row. Yesterday it just felt so pure and so clear, so good. Because it was about, you know, they invited God. And, and, and everybody there, it was like, 
you, you know, everybody's, you know, everybody like, oh God, you know, when's he going to stop talking and stuff? Obviously, but deep down inside, you could tell it was okay talking about God this way. This is, yeah, I agree. I agree. It was beautiful. We have to, it's time to redefine. If, if, if what true parents said is true, that Satan is no more, that we're living in the age after, you know, after the completed testament age, the, the age of Chernobyl, the age when their God is fully liberated and free completely, then it is our responsibility to keep fallen nature away from the kingdom of heaven. Each of us is our responsibility. How? By trusting, trusting God, knowing God, knowing God to the core of our being and not allowing this small thinking to get in the way. I have to move into another realm. The Old Testament age and New Testament age were not ages for the ideal family. Those ages belong to the providential age for the salvation of the individual, where the main focus was on individual salvation alone. The age of the salvation of the family is the completed testament age. When families combine as a federation, they move into the age of the providence for the salvation of clans, and beyond that to the salvation of nations. The blessing ceremony eradicates the fallen lineage, which had been the fate of fallen man, transfers ownership of the lineage back to God, and brings about a transformation of heart. Indeed, there is no greater grace than this. Ownership. God owns this universe. God owns the world. God owns every nation. God owns every race. God owns every family. And God owns you and I. God is our parent, the designer and the creator, and he has the authority over us now. According to his choosing, according to his time, according to his providence, according to his desire and his goal and his schedule, we will all be saved. But we are participants. We can choose to go in the direction closer to God or to continue to go away from God. It is a choice. If we follow the principle, we will find the strength to be able to overcome the challenges that are in front of us. Whatever it is that's causing you to doubt or causing you to somehow not feel like you're where you should be, it's, it's okay. God will help you get through it. God is the eternal parent. Throughout history, mankind has dreamed of heaven, an ideal world. But what is the reality that we see today? Society today has become the kingdom of free sex and individualism amidst family breakdown and the loss of values. In such an environment based on fallen man, it is impossible to have the correct view of life and values, let alone a correct view of the world and the universe. We therefore cannot expect to have hope of creating or perfecting harmony either within the individual or on the level of the whole. In the past century, many people placed their hopes on the utopian movements under the banners of communism and equality. The communist movement created a stir and shook the world. But in reality, the only thing the people of the communist sphere experienced was inequality and exploitation, misfortune and fear. And that movement ended in failure. On the other hand, a system was built with the dreams of democracy and freedom as the highest values and ideals. But what was the result? This system spurred man's self-centered desire for pleasure 
and brought about decadence and corruption, imbalance and disorder. The future of democracy is also unclear. Last week, I don't know if you knew about it, but Calvin Klein put out a big billboard in many cities, and they put out an advertisement. And this advertisement, the other half of the picture, is what it says. Here's the very, an action that all of us would agree would probably put people in jail for abusing young, you know, young girls, and it's being used as a way of selling a product. In America, this is the culture that has been created in a land that is free, but is still influenced by fallen society. Why am I showing this picture like this? This was the copy of Newsweek in 2012. What does this mean, this picture? Is Barack Obama gay? No. What does it mean, the gay president? It means he has surrounded himself by people who 100% support all of the desires and the activities and promote this agenda. That's why last week the Justice Department decided to sue North Carolina because North Carolina had made a law to try to protect children from this transgender uh, issue. And so instead of accepting and allowing North Carolina as a state to work out its situation with its own people, this administration has aggressively attacked the state and using the Attorney General, the police of the United States, accusing North Carolina of being an evil place, uncivil, and, and going against civil rights. And do you know that this, yes? I just want to bring to your attention that it's not the first time that North Carolina has been sued recently. They were also sued over the ID laws for voter registration. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they are going to get sued again because of the unfair Medicaid situation in this state. So there's a lot of things that are going on in North Carolina that isn't correct. Oh, I agree with you 100%. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. But this leads to something else that the Obama administration has now done. Now, they are sending out a letter to all the schools in the country. And they are in saying that every school in the nation now has to follow their definition of what civil rights is concerning this transgender legislation. So I agree 100%, North Carolina, any state has problems and issues. But the question is, at who will determine or decide how to deal with these issues? Here, we have the Attorney General of the United States saying this is the issue and this is the solution. Here's 25 pages of you know, information and now you must follow this rule and bring it to all the students in your schools, every school in the country. Now that is tyrannical. It's it's, it's a, a government deciding for you how to deal with an issue as personal as the, 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 the sexuality and the sexual situation of your own children. That is a problem. That is an issue that is now being forced upon us. The letter which is signed by officials of the Justice Department will be sent out to the districts on Friday. While the letter does not have the force of law, it does warn that schools that do not abide by the administration's interpretation of civil rights law may face lawsuits or a loss of federal aid. There is no room in our schools for discrimination of any kind, including discrimination against transgender students on the basis of their sex. 
Attorney General Loretta Lynch said in a statement, as is consistently recognized in civil rights cases, the desire to accommodate others' discomfort cannot justify a policy that singles out and disadvantages a particular class of students, the guidance says. In other words, we don't care if your children are in an uncomfortable situation. That's their problem. We have determined and decided that this group of people, this transgender group of people, this is how you're going to solve the problem. And these are the rules you're going to follow and solve it by. This is the situation where that's being faced now. The morality, the, the, the confusion in morality in this nation has reached this level. It's, it's sad and frightening, but in a, I believe it has to come out. It has to come out in order for the problem to ultimately be dealt with. In the speech, as Father continues, he says, all these things are a direct result of man estranging himself from God, the true parent, throughout our long history. Thus, the most urgent task for people in the present age who wander about unable to find an exit from unhappiness and suffering is to seek out and come to know God and come to understand original sin and the spiritual world. Alone, the individual cannot achieve the ideal of happiness. It is only possible when he establishes the proper relationship to his family, tribe, race, nation, world, cosmos, and God. It is the ideal of God's true love that can bring about the perfection of all these things. It's a very real situation. All of us are facing it. But it's very personal. It's very personal. Each of us is responsible now to, to, to meet God inside our minds and our hearts and to be, to, to, to be able to manifest the love of God in everything that we do. Only this way will we be able to solve these problems and deal with these issues. God is the parent of mankind. So, of course, it's obvious, you know, uh, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, everybody has an opinion and a viewpoint, and the situation is sometimes very confusing. And it's always mixed. It's always mixed. There's always the good and the bad. There's the right and the wrong. It never seems to be very clear. But ultimately, fundamentally, God, as the eternal parent of mankind, can come into our minds and into our hearts and can guide us and can show us and lead us ultimately into the ideal. The future world in the new age will not be a world under a man-centered ideology. It will be a world under Godism, the ideology of our Heavenly Father under which we attend God as King. Thus, the age of true parentism, the age of true love is dawning. The age of nationalism has passed. Even a superpower nation cannot exist on its own. Thus the age of unilateralism has passed. A new age has dawned when national boundaries will be eliminated and we will live together harmoniously beyond nation, religion, and race. Yeah. Yeah, it's, these issues are real. We see them now coming to, to life. But, you know, God is with us. God is with us. And God is with each person. And so God is going to work in a mysterious way. I'm going to conclude here. Because I, you know, for the purpose of time, I truly believe that God is moving in mysterious ways in this nation. But it's very important for us to understand that the solution to our problem is not going to come from our government. It's not going to come from religion. It's not going to come from politics or from you know social engineering. It's not going to come from the psychologists or the psychiatrists 
or you know, it's going to come from very profoundly deep. This is spiritual, a spiritual providence going on, a spiritual world that's moving, and God's the people of God are not necessarily going to look like we think. You know, you think back, go back 40 years when True Father came to this country. You know, how different this Korean man coming to America, going around preaching about Christianity, and he completely misunderstood. Completely misunderstood. The media couldn't get it. The average person didn't get it. And, and all these stories came up and all these accusations. But who was God working through? Who was God working through? Despite whatever the public says, despite whatever seems to be on the surface, where is God working in this nation, in this world? We have to really pray and pray sincerely. So I don't know. I don't have the answers. I, I can't say clearly. But I do know. I do know from my personal experience, my personal struggles, my personal uh, events in my life, God is with us. God is with us because of true parents. True parents are the true parents of mankind. Everything is unfolding according to the way true parents said it would. And we, our responsibility is to, to know God personally, to, to know God, and to, to stop, stop accusing each other, stop thinking that you know better than someone else what they need in their life or, 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 or judging people from the external. Because everyone's life is unique. Everyone's life is unique and special and different. And as much as there is a, a, a history in people's own families, even a, a visible history, a history of events that took place in our lives when we were growing up, there is an invisible history. All of us come from not just an actual history of our, our growing up as a child in our families through the influence of all these different people at school and our parents and our grandparents and uncles and aunts and everything, but there's an invisible, an invisible history behind each one of us that only God knows. Only God knows. So we have to really connect to the love of God. God loves us. God's love is powerful. And God's love, the true love force and the power of true love, if you connect to that, that is what is going to attract people. People are going to be attracted by the love of God. We must overcome whatever it is that's between us. We have to become transparent. We have to become accountable. We have to become honest. We have to become open. And it's, it's tough. It's difficult to do. Especially it's difficult to do. I mean, it's difficult enough to do on the individual or the family level. But then you move into society. You move into the nation. We've created an environment in this country where it's very difficult to, to find your way around to know who's, who's who and who's what and who's doing what. But I'm confident, I'm very confident, God clearly, God clearly sees the mind and the heart of each person. So God will help us. God will help us through this time. Let us pray. 
dearest Heavenly Parent God, I really pray that you can help each one of us to never forget that you are our eternal parent, that you are the designer and creator of the universe, and you are guiding this providence. Whatever events are taking place on a global level, on a national level, on a cultural level, on a racial level, in the family, even in our own lives, let us not forget that you are part of our lives. You are, you want to be part of our lives. You want to guide us and, and, sh and show us the way and help us to live a true life, a good life, a healthy life, a wholesome life, a productive life. Heavenly Parent, each of us here has limitations. Each of us here is biased or prejudiced on some level or another. Even against our own self, we have concepts and ideas about our own self because of our past and our history. But many of those concepts are lies. It's not the way you see us. It's not the way we want to be. We want to change and we want to grow and we want to become true sons and true daughters. We beg you, our Heavenly Parent, please bless this world. Guide the people of this world. Guide the nations. Guide the leaders. Help them to change their minds and their hearts and to grow and become your true sons and your true daughters. Help each one of us to open up our own minds and our own hearts so that we can let you into our mind and heart. You can love us. You can forgive us. You can encourage us. You can fill us with strength so that in our weaknesses, we find strength. Maybe you won't take away the thorn in our side. Maybe we will someday have to take it away ourselves. But we are moving toward you. Thank you again and again for this providence, for this, this reality that we became true sons and true daughters centered on the true parents. Heavenly Parent God, thank you. I pray for every brother and sister here, for every family, all the members, all of the blessed couples. Help us, Father, help us to, to be humble and, and weak that we might inherit the earth. Help us to never be conceited, arrogant, thinking we know the best way. Just help us to support each other and encourage each other and appreciate the sacrifices that each one has made. Sacrifices that none of us can really be fully aware of. Like the sacrifices that the true parents made, that, that you made through history, all through history, thousands of years. How can we even imagine your heart and your spirit? And yet, and yet, you're just, you're so full of hope. You're so full of confidence. You're so full of courage. And you're so uplifting. It's incredible. Heavenly Parent, thank you. I pray your will be done. Thy kingdom will come and your will will be done on this earth, in this earthly plane, as it can be done in heaven. Please forgive me, Father, for my own small mind and my own small heart. I just pray that I can grow up also. Thank you. Thank you, Father. We offer our prayers to you. We offer our lives to you. We, we offer our families to you and our tribes and our nation, this world. We offer to you and thank you for it and report these things in our names as blessed central families. In my name, John Pace, with Sharon Pace as a blessed central family. Amen. 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 Amen.